So um, thank you yeah, very much everyone to, um, for joining this webinar. Um, hopefully it's going to be good. I'm just going to start with a quick caveat at the very start saying that my Wi-Fi has been a bit intermittent recently. So if I suddenly freeze or the audio stops, don't worry, I should be back in about 30 seconds. So we, we did a practice of, we were doing a practice of this presentation and it actually cut out during that practice and I was back in about 15 to 20 seconds. So it's very, very likely that that's going to happen. So don't, don't worry if um, it does, I'll be back hopefully pretty soon. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you everyone for taking the time to do this. Um, I hope everyone's well. I know it's a very difficult time for everyone. So I really do appreciate you all taking some time out of your day to, to listen to me talk. Um, but hopefully, hopefully it's going to be worth your time and I'm looking forward to it. So I'm going to be talking about um, the present, the talk's called The Revolution is Coming, the Medium Term Future of AI and ML. It's a, it's a little bit of a clickbaity title. I think maybe it should have been called um, A Revolution Might Be Coming. Um, but nonetheless, it, it should be fun to, to talk about. So um, to introduce myself, my name is Sam Ringer and I'm a machine learning engineer at a company called Speechmatics, which is a speech text company based in Cambridge. So in terms of what the company does, um, we the company is a transcription company. So we use machine learning. So someone will give us an audio file, we'll send it through a neural network and then it will spit out a, tra a transcript. So basically a guess of what's being being said in that, that audio file. Um, so we're based in Cambridge in the UK. Um, and my role inside the business is that I am a, um, a mixture of an engineer and a researcher. So I definitely sit more on the, the academic side of, of what we do. And I'm looking at um, future technical directions the company could go in in terms of our machine learning and AI capability. So that involves both developing products sometimes, but mainly um, doing research and writing papers and trying to get them published and, and that sort of stuff. Um, so yeah, if, any, if anyone has any questions about the business or about what I do, put put them in the um, the question section, and I'll try and try and answer them as I go along. But um, yeah, so the kind of the overview of this talk and what I'd like to everyone to get out of it is that um, as I said, I, I sit very much on the the academic side of machine learning as opposed to the industrial uh, production side of things, which I think probably a decent chunk of people in this webinar are going to be coming from. I assume most of you are going to be coming from industry, trying to build machine learning tools and um, and selling them. Um, so I, I thought it might be good to sort of get everyone up to speed a little bit on what's actually happening in terms of recent academic progress that's been made and recent research progress that's been made in machine learning. And hope, I hope it's not going to be too dry. So don't don't let the word um, academic turn you off. Um, just just so everyone's aware that um, the, there has been progress made in certain areas of the field. And an, an analogy I like to think of in this case is um, lots of people are building products about where the capability that machine learning has at the moment. Um, and when you're building out these products, it's kind of like you're, um, you're shooting at like a gun, uh, a moving target, okay? So most people are aiming at the target. And what you really want to be doing is aiming ahead of the target to where the target's gonna be. So I thought it might be useful for people to at least get a flavor of where things might be in 10 years so they can start thinking about it and pre preparing for it now. Um, again, these are just predictions. Um, I have no idea whether they're gonna be right or not. They're sort of just my best guess about looking at current trends and what's happening, um, where things might be in the near future. Um, so we're just gonna do a little bit of, um, before we can understand where things are going in the future, I, uh, it's probably good just to do a little recap of how where things are in the present moment. So most of you, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the technical background is of the audience, so we'll try and keep it. A fairly fairly basic level but um if most of you have interacted with machine learning you're probably interacting with a, a sub really a subfield of machine learning called supervised learning and actually there are lots of different fields within machine learning of which supervised learning is just one and supervised learning is really the one that's got the most um attention in, in recent years um so what what supervised learning is is we take something called a, a neural network so we don't we're not going to focus on too much about what this neural network actually is you can just think of it as like um a collection of numbers um, and the first thing we need to do is we need to train this neural network so we're going to train a neural network to distinguish between pictures of cats and pictures of dogs so we want to send it a picture of a cat and the neural network should say this is a cat or the same thing for a dog so how we're going to train it is we're going to get a picture of a cat and then we're going to tell the neural network this is a cat okay then the neural network is going to learn from that so when we say machine learning this is the learning part um, it's gonna okay, say, okay, when I see images that look like this, I should predict cat. Um, similarly, if we show it a dog, uh, we're gonna tell it 
this is a dog. So during the training phase, what we have on the left-hand side, and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but hopefully you can. What we have on the left-hand side is called the input data. And what we have on the right-hand side is called the label. So we're gonna send in some input data of a cat, and then we're gonna provide the label cat. So we actually need to tell our neural network what is inside this image. Um, and when we're training these supervised learning systems, we have to provide all these labels by hand. So I have to have all these images of cats, and I need to go through each one and say, this is a cat, this is a cat, this is a cat. And the same thing for our whole load of, of images of dogs, I have to say, this is a dog, this is a dog, this is a dog. Um, and the end result is once this is trained, we can send in a new picture, and our neural network should be able to say, oh, this is a dog, even if it hasn't seen this exact picture before. Um, so a lot of the progress you've probably been aware of in, in machine learning is, is fall onto this paradigm of supervised learning, which is, is really input data, provide the labels. Uh, and that, that's kind of like a high level overview of what supervised learning is. So some other examples where you might um, have come across it. So one is um, translation, if you ever use Google Translate. So here the input data is say the English text and the label is the, in this case I've gone for Samoan, so the Samoan text. So when I'm training this, I'll need to have lots and lots of examples of English sentences and the corresponding labels, which are um, the translations in Samoan. So I need to have basically someone hand translate that um, first before I can train this system. And I know Google's doing some cleverish stuff to get around that. Um, so if any of you activists on translation, I, I'm, I apologize because that's not completely fair of what's exactly happening. Um, another example a bit close to home is, is speech to text. So at Speechmatics, when we train our neural networks, what we do is we have um, several thousand hours worth of audio. And at some stage in time, someone has gone through and they have hand transcribed what is in that audio. So they'll listen to it and they'll type out what's being said. Um, and as you can imagine, that takes quite a long time if you're listening to say 6,000 hours worth of audio. And then we train our neural networks to listen to the audio and try and predict that text that someone has written out by hand first of all. And the end result is what we end up with is a neural network where when you give it new audio, it's gonna um, spit out what the transcript is without someone needing to hand label it. But to do that, we, need, we do some supervised training beforehand where we need both these um, data and labels. So yeah, but going back to this cats and dogs classifier, what I need to do is I need to get all my pictures of cats and dogs that I need to go through by hand and say, this is a cat, this is a, do a dog, this is a cat. Uh, I know that seems pretty easy, but it's not, it's not massively straightforward when you're trying to annotate, say, 100,000 of these, which is kind of the amount of data you need um, if you're trying to train a supervised learning system, which actually works at scale. Um, just another example, um, which really, I think, highlights the problems with supervised learning is, uh, so when Tesla are training their self-driving cars, they rely very, very heavily on supervised learning. So the way they get their labeled data is they have all their cars recording the road in front of them, and then they take those recordings, they send it off to a, um, some, I think they're called sort of data labeling factories, where someone will go through and they will hand annotate exactly what all the objects in that frame are. So they have to go and they have to not only say this is a car, but they have to draw around the car exactly and they have to draw around the traffic light exactly. And if you can imagine the amount of um, data that Tesla needs to train a self-driving car, it is, it is ridiculous. And they spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of pounds, trying to get this right. So for them, getting good quality um, supervised learning labeled data is, is really, really important. So yeah. In this supervised learning regime, label data is absolutely your bread and butter. You can't really do anything without it. So it's really, really important. And as a result of that, you can see there are lots of companies who um, are springing up to basically make this data labeling easier. So as I said, if I want to train a cats and dogs classifier, I have to, um, I have to label each one by hand, which is going to take me ages. So what I might do is I might pay, I don't know, a thousand different people all to label a hundred different images each. And um, so I can outsource that and then I can use that as my training data. And that's very time consuming to set up and it's quite slow as well. So what the, these companies do is they try and make that process um, basically easier and a bit quicker. And this is only something that's really existed, I think in like the last five years, trying to do this data labeling scale. So it's quite a new phenomenon. Um, and I think this sort of partly feeds into when you hear people saying, oh, data is the new oil. Um, this isn't entirely what this phrase encapsulates, but part of it is if you want to train machine learning systems, you've got to have data, like good and, and not just data, but lots of it and really good quality data. So we, we don't want any of it to be mislabeled. So we don't want any pictures of cats 
accidentally mislabeled as dogs because that's going to confuse our neural network and it's really it's really going to screw us up so hopefully that's a bit of an understanding of why why people keep banging on about data and why why data is um is so important for machine learning so what are some problems with this um i, I basically touched on on a decent chunk of them so needing lots of labeled data is it, it doesn't scale. So if I decide I want to, you know, have 10 times as much data, so I don't want 100,000 images of cats, I want a million instead, that is 10 times as hard to get, basically. Um, it's expensive because you have to basically either pay someone to do it or do it yourself. And most people, if you want to label 100,000 of anything, you're going to pay a group of people to do it. So it's very expensive. It's time consuming. Um, even if you pay loads of other people to do it, there's all sorts of overheads. Um, in terms of getting it done, waiting for it to be labeled, getting the data back. And that's what the, the companies I showed you in the um, slide, two slides back, I think. They're basically trying to make these two things um, better. So they're trying to make it less expensive and less time consuming. Um, and I think this is quite an exciting point is that we know it is at least possible that we don't have to do this. So I could show you an animal that you haven't seen before and i could show you one maybe two images of that animal and you'll be able to recognize it in all future images um, so there are algorithms that do not need this much labeled data they only need one or two examples of labeled data and that's the algorithm in your brain so it is possible that if we were to create the brain we would have algorithms that do not need this much labeled data um, a point i haven't added on this is there's also the risk of the data being mislabeled, as I mentioned earlier. So our, our transcripts we use at Speechmatics, um, some of them are um, mislabeled. So when people talk about data cleaning, it's often like trying to clean up these errors. So some of the transcripts are all in capital letters, some have punctuation, some don't. We have to do all this cleaning up that requires lots and lots of effort. So that, that's like another issue um, that tends to take up a lot of machine learning engineers' time is this, this data cleaning process. Um, and at least part of that is due to the fact that you have to have good labels corresponding to your data. So the first sort of new thing I want to talk about is um, this new-ish field called self-supervised learning, as opposed to supervised learning, which is what we were talking about precedingly and what kind of all mainstream stuff up to now has been inside that paradigm. So in terms of defining self-supervised learning, I think it's best to first just show you some examples of it because it's the definition is a little bit technical, and if I were to tell it to you now, we'll, we'll get to it in a few seconds time, but if I tell it to you now, it would probably seem very confusing, but we're just going to look at some examples um, first of all. So the first example of self-supervised learning we're going to look at, um, which has seen a lot of progress in natural language processing, is language modeling. So what we do with a language model is we take a sentence, or at least part of a sentence, and we have to predict the next word in that sentence. So the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy, and then we'd say dog. So that's what the language model is. It's I'm taking a sentence and I'm trying to predict the next word. So another example is the cat sat on the, and then we'd say um, mat. We could also say table or something like that. Um, and then final example is the Union Jack is white, blue, and red. I mean, if, if I was doing this live, hopefully I'd get you to, to say the answers yourselves, but hopefully you can um, you've worked these ones out. So. I think the power of self-supervised learning can really be demonstrated in this last sentence. So let's think about what we need to know in order to be able to say, okay, the next word in this sentence is red. So for those of you who don't know, the Union Jack is the flag of um, Great Britain um, and it's red, white, and blue. So I, I'm looking at this sentence and I say, okay, it's asking about some sort of object and it's saying it is color, color, and so I'm probably gonna have to predict another color there. Um, what is it asking about? It's asking about the Union Jack. Okay, I know what the Union Jack looks like. It's uh, red, white, and blue. They've already said white and blue, so therefore the remaining color is red. And obviously we look at that sentence and it's really easy for us, but in terms of the deduction process we have to go through, it's quite, it's not massively straightforward. So the rationale behind language modeling is that if I can take part of the sentence and predict the next word with high accuracy, I actually have a really rich understanding of um, not just grammar and language, but also kind of things about how the world works. Um, so the thing to take home here, and the key thing to realize, is that to be able to train language models, we don't actually need any labeled data. So all we need is text, and just lots and lots of text, and then I can just 
chunk, you know, I can pick a random sentence and I can get my neural network to predict the next word. I don't need anyone to hand label that. It means I can basically just download it from the internet and, and that's it. So there's no shortage of textual data out there uh, to train language models on. So some of the big language models at the moment are basically trained on like 80% of the internet or, or something like that, the English internet. So that's one example of self-supervised learning. Um, it's not just a natural language thing. So um, this is an example of self-supervised learning in images. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this image of the tiger here and I'm gonna cut out nine squares and then I'm gonna mix them up. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the neural network to basically unmix these. So the neural network doesn't know how I've mixed them up, but it's just trying to sort them out. So let's, let's think about again, what does the neural network need to know and to be able to understand to successfully unmix these nine squares? And it seems really obvious for us. Um, but so it needs to know, OK, uh, I see these stripes. I'm looking at they look like tiger stripes. So I'm probably looking at a tiger. OK, how are tigers structured? OK, they normally have their head at the top and normally their legs are underneath. So um, this here, that's a tiger's head. Yep. Yeah, so that's going to go above the legs. Um, I need these stripes to sort of be continuous because I know natural images, the patterns are continuous, they don't change abruptly. And so it sort of works it all out. So to be able to unmix these nine squares, you need lots and lots of rich knowledge about how the visual world operates. Um, and again, the key thing to realize here is I don't need any labels for this image. All I need is lots and lots and lots of images. So I don't need to know there's a tiger in this image. You can give me any image, I can cut out nine random squares, I can mix them up, I can feed them through a neural network, and then I can train it to try and unscramble them. So without using any labels, I can get neural networks that have much richer understandings about, um, about how the visual world operates, which is great, you know, labeled data, fantastic. Um, and to drive this home, I, I talked about the algorithms of the, of the brain, and the current theory is that humans, the main way we learn about the world is through self-supervised learning. So we're going out, we're sort of predicting what we're going to see next. Um, uh, we're not actually, in terms of the amount of direct supervision we get, it's actually pretty rare. It's very, it's very rare your parents actually say, do this, don't do this, or a teacher says, do this or don't do this. The vast majority of the knowledge we acquire is through um, self-supervised learning. Uh, some other examples of self-supervised learning, I'm sure you could, you could think of them. Um, but it's, let's say I have a film and I look at 10 seconds of the film and I want to predict the next frame. Um, it could be I'm listening to someone speaking and I want to predict the sound that's going to come out of their mouth next. Um, it could be I take a colorized image, I make it black and white, and then I have to predict what the colors were. You have to quite a lot of understanding about like how colors operate and like how color should be, should be contiguous in images. So you can come up with lots and lots of these tasks and none of them require labels, which is very exciting. So. Here's the, the technical def, de, um, definition I, I said we'd come back to. So in supervised learning, we take some data and we predict a label. So we take an image of a cat and we predict the cat label. In self-supervised learning, we take some data and we predict a property of that data. So we take a sentence, we predict the next word. Um, we take an image, scramble it up, and we predict how it was originally orientated and so on. So we don't need any labels, so that's great. Um, and the exciting thing is that this is actually working. So this is a self-supervised system called um, CPC, which is Contrasted Predictive Coding, which is a, a deep mind paper. Um, I, this is the driest slide in the presentation, so I, I apologize if it's, a bit, if it's a bit uninteresting. But what they did is they trained a self-supervised learning system, and then they injected a very, very small amount of labeled data. And what they showed is this blue line here is the self-supervised system. And it actually outperformed a fully supervised system that was trained on much, much more data. Um, so that's really exciting. Like they have a system that not only matches um, another system that has access to way more labeled data, but actually does better. So that's that's very exciting that people are kind of starting to get this working. So this is where I'm sort of going to think a little bit ahead to what are the implications of self supervised um, of, of these sorts of techniques if if they start to make more progress. They're not they're not quite there yet to the extent that they're being used. Um, everywhere in machine learning, but what happens if in five to ten years they really take off and come to dominate the, the machine learning landscape? So, again, these are just predictions. Feel free to disagree with me, put a question in saying I'm wrong, and we can hopefully talk about it at the end. Um, but I think that there will be a much smaller demand to get data labeled. So, when I'm training, I, in ten years' time, if I want to train a cats and dogs classifier, I won't need to get, um, I won't need to pay someone to 
hand label 10,000 images of cats and 10,000 images of dogs. I'll only need one or two examples. So there'd just be less um, demand for that sort of data labeling um, behavior. The barrier to entry to produce production level machine learning models drops. Um, I think this one's quite exciting actually. Um, so at the moment, if um, I want to say, um, I want to build like a state of the art speech to text system like Speechmatic has. So at the moment, Speechmatics, we can do this because we have access to say 10,000 hours of labeled English data. Um, if you're just some like kid in your bedroom, you can't do that. There's no way in hell you're going to get access to 10,000 hours worth of labeled audio data. Um, however, if you have strong self supervision, you can just download, say, you know, all of the audio books on the internet that are available for free, and you can use that as your training data, and you, you don't need any labels. So um, the barrier to entry to produce strong machine learning models will, will hopefully go down. Um, and then finally, data becomes less valuable as an asset. So Tesla at the moment have, um, I don't want to put numbers in their mouths, but they must have surely tens of thousands of hours worth of um, labeled data coming from cars. And that's actually quite a big asset. There are definitely other self-driving car companies who will pay a lot of money to get a hold of that data. However, we know it only takes humans about 20 hours worth of training to be able to drive. So in theory, you only really need 20 hours of that data. Um, so if that's the case, does all this data that Tesla have suddenly become a lot less valuable? And I think the answer is probably less, yes. So Speechmatics, we have loads and loads of data, loads and loads of label data, and that's, it's, it's not entirely our value prop, but there's some, some amount of IP we claim to own is in the form of the data we have sitting on our computers. Um, and if suddenly you don't need all that data to train machine learning models, then maybe it becomes less valuable. Um, again, these are just kind of me trying to puzzle things together, so I might, I might be completely wrong. Um, time will tell. Um, just something I want you to, to caveat here is that data is not homogenous. Um, so what I, what I mean by that, this relates to my previous point of saying oh, some data might be much less valuable in the future. I think that applies to companies like Tesla, but not to companies like Facebook. Um, the rule of thumb I'd use to work, to, to think about how you distinguish these two companies is if the label data you have is something that a human could label in less than a second, there's a good chance it's not going to be worth very much in, in five to 10 years. So I can look at a picture of a cat and I can label it in less than a second. I can say this is a cat. However, the data that Facebook have it's very, very um, niche, tailored data specific to individual people. So if I were to look at a person on the street and I were to say, um, what films do they like? There's basically no amount of time I would have to be able to work that out and label, like come up with that label, whereas Facebook can do it because it, the, the sort of data they have is very different. So there, there are definitely caveats here. And I'm not saying that um, uh, all label data is gonna be meaningless. It's, it's sort of things like visual data, auditory data, um, video data that might be worth a lot less, but stuff like the very specific um, data that Facebook has about its users or Amazon has about supply chains or all that sort of stuff, I think probably will stay valuable. Um, so um, yeah, I, when, I, when I came up with this analogy, it, it did make me cringe a little bit. So um, uh, it may well make you cringe too, but ho hopefully uh, there's some truth in it. So I think that the data is the new oil um, uh, sort of fay phrase probably isn't correct. And I think a more accurate phrase is something like data is the new oxygen. So companies don't consider owning and managing large amounts of oxygen as a key part of their value prop. So um, there's no company out there at the moment saying, oh, you know, we are a really great company to, to purchase from and to invest in because we have access to 10 times as much oxygen as our next competitor. Um, that'd just be ridiculous. However, there are companies who are saying, uh, we are have a competitive advantage over our competitors because we have 10 times as much data as them. And what they're saying at the moment is actually true. The fact that they do have more data is a competitive advantage. But in the future, there's a chance that them saying that will become completely, completely meaningless. However, data is still essential. So I still need access to loads and loads of um, speech data or loads and loads of images, but um, I don't need them to be labeled. And this sort of data is everywhere, it's everywhere on the internet. So there's no shortage of this and there's no scarcity. So I think maybe data is the new oxygen is kind of a slightly better way of thinking about our, how our relationship with data will be in the next um, 10 years.
So the kind of the second thing I want to talk about is um, generalization and understanding. Um, again, probably worth uh, showing a few kind of fun examples um, that I've, the, the first one I actually pinched from a, an academic at UC Berkeley called Alexi Afros, and I thought this was really, really good. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm unashamedly pinching it. So um, you may be aware of what like an image captioning system is. So that's where I take an image, I feed it to a neural network and it can spit out a caption. So in this case, I take this image, I feed it to a neural network and it will spit out a car parked by the side of the road. And this is just incredible. This was, this was unthinkable 10 years ago um, that you could have such a complicated picture and come up with a sentence that is coherent English and makes sense. So this is, um, this like got people really, really excited uh, with good reason. However, if I send in this image to the same image captioning system, it will probably output a car parked by the side of the road. So the same thing, and maybe this is okay. You know, it's only seen images. It doesn't really understand this car's moving. I, th I think you know we'd still give it like a seven out of ten. It's pretty good. Of all the captions it could have come up with, this is this is not too bad. However, we send in this image, it will probably still say a car parked by the side of the road. And, and now you're starting to not really give it the benefit of the doubt so much. And then finally, if I send in this image, it will still say a car parked by the side of the road. So clearly, our neural networks they just do not understand the world at all. Their understanding is very, very superficial. As soon as you give them something that is a little bit different to what they've seen before, they just, they completely break down. And this isn't just image captioning, it happens in, in basically all forms of supervised machine learning. Um, I think a really telling example, which is, uh, might ruffle a few feathers, is, is, is talking about conversational agents. So here's an example I found on the internet. So, so it's a chat bot and someone's basically using it to order a delivery. So, okay, are you ready to pick up your order or do you prefer delivery? Pick up. All right, our opening times are Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. Looking forward to see you there. Your opening times are bad. Please deliver it, deliver it to my home. Sorry, I didn't get that. And I think we've kind of, if any of you have Alexa or Google Home, we've kind of all had these sorts of experiences where um, we're trying to interact with these agents. And as soon as you do something even a little bit different to what it's expecting, it just completely breaks. And this, this is just completely commonplace, but there are lots and lots of people claiming to sell like really powerful chatbots and really powerful conversational agents. And what they're doing is basically just at the moment, it's kind of like cheap tri trickery, it's sort of looking for very specific things and there's a sort of a tree of ways it can go down. But this, this chatbot does not understand anything about language or um, about how humans converse. Um, so another example is sentiment analysis. So again, there are lots of companies claiming that they can do really, really good sentiment analysis using the latest advances in AI and machine learning. So here's another example I found on the internet. So someone who was um, was flying to Calcutta and they lost their baggage and they were sort of tweeting a sarcastic tweet of the airline. So thank you for sending my baggage to Hyde and flying me to Calcutta at the same time. Brilliant service. Glad to hear that. Are you serious? So there's clearly some chatbot out here that's just trying to um, trying to gauge whether when people tweet at it, whether it's like they think that this person has had good service and it's thanking the flight company or they have bad service and then they can respond appropriately. And here it just does not understand that this guy's being sarcastic and then it makes a bit of a, a blunder which makes it just look worse um so let's let's think about what uh has to happen for this um this chatbot to correctly to say oh no we're sorry to hear that can, can we help you so it has to understand that this person's flown to calcutta they have to understand that their baggage which should be with them is flown to hide and has to also to understand that the baggage should end up in the same place as the person and the fact that they're saying that this hasn't happened so this hasn't happened and then this person saying brilliant service means they're being sarcastic which is a, a whole other thing in and of itself um so in order to be able to do that a machine learning system has to have a really really good inference system to be able to understand what people are actually wanting and it has to have a, a really deep understanding of the world but most sentiment systems that you see all they're really looking is for like one or two keywords. So here it sees the word brilliant and it thinks, okay, this person's had a great time, let's, let's tweet at them appropriately. So there, there's just no understanding going on here. And essentially every um, sentiment system or chatbot system you see is pulling some form of trickery along these lines. Um, and it's very, very brittle and it might work in some situations, but on the whole, it's, it's a long way from being solved. Um, and in a slightly different domain, what do you think Tesla do when they see this traffic light? Um, it's outside of their training data, they haven't seen anything like this before, the chances are their system will just completely break down. Um, 
and in a, like a slightly more academic setting, there's this data set called ObjectNet, where what they do is they train a normal image classifier to take an image and classify it as to one of, um, in this case, it's a, a thousand different classes. So before we had cats and dogs, which was two different classes. Here you take an image and you output one of a thousand different classes. So this data set just consists of images in sort of under in places and under angles that they're not normally photographed from. So it's very rare you have oven mitts lying on a bed, and it's very rare that you have someone holding a hammer like this. Is the hammer's normally either by itself or they're, they're holding it like this. It's very rare they have this sort of weird um, grip on it. And, and what happens in this case is all these image classification systems that everyone's raving about, saying they're amazing, they drop their accuracy by 70%, which is unbelievable because we can obviously see that the right hand side's a hammer and we can obviously see the left hand side is some other bits. But our machine learning systems, it completely breaks them. So that's that's quite a quite worrying. Um, I'm taking a few liberties here with the, the terminology, but this, this is often called out distribution generalization. So generalization is basically the ability to do well on things you haven't seen before. And out of distribution generalization is the ability to do things that are not only you haven't seen before, but are in a slightly different setting to what you've seen before. So it might be the other mitts on the bed. Um, and we want we want our machine learning systems to be good at out distribution generalization. Um, unlike supervised uh, self-supervised learning, there hasn't actually been as much progress in this area. Um, this uh, this guy here on the right is uh, someone called Yoshua Bengio, who he recently won the Turing Award, which is like the the Nobel Prize in machine learning. And um, out of distribution generalization is something he's really interested in. And he's sort of proposed some ways we might begin to attack this problem. Um, one of the things he advocates, and I'm, I'm missing a few out, but one of the things he advocates is um, we have to have machine learning systems that understand causality. And causality is basically what causes what. So if I take a brick and throw it out a window and the window smashes, we can say, okay, the brick caused the window to smash, and I threw the brick which caused it to go into the window. And that's, you know, it's so obvious to us that it just seems ridiculous that um, I'd even have to articulate that. But most neural networks, they cannot do this. They, they have no understanding of causality whatsoever, which makes it very hard for them to, to, to reason about, about the world. Um, and actually, this is, this is really hot off the press. This is a paper that went online. Um, um, was it this week? I think it was the end of last week. It's a really good paper and it's actually quite accessible um, as machine learning papers go. So I, I recommend people read this because I really think it's um, in some ways quite a seminal work. Um, uh, what this paper does is it basically talks about how can we have agents that understand the world in the, the rich sense needed to produce good conversational agents or have good sentiment analysis. And again, they advocate for things like causality. They also um advocate for um having systems that they don't just look at language they look at images at the same time in video and they listen to audio at the same time um systems that can actually go out and take action in the world and that there's i think the last one is having systems that actually we train them by conversing with humans so really recommend this paper it's sort of um hopefully the first step in solving some of these problems again this is just predictions about where things might be in 10 years and i'm, I'm hoping we're going to have made some progress in in this area in uh, in 10 years time so um, most what the stuff we're interested in at the moment um, is kind of the technical, well, it's technical, but a way, way of thinking about it is mappings. So what we do is we take an image and we map it to a label, um, or we take some audio and we map it to a transcript, or we take an English sentence and we map it to a French sentence. Um, and supervised learning systems have actually been really good at learning mappings. Um, however, what we'd really like is um, to learn representations. So um, a representation is like when I look at an image of a dog, I understand uh, not only that it's a dog, but sort of what breed it is, whether it's looking happy or sad, what the lighting's like, it's just a much richer understanding of the image. And we're hopefully seeing that self-supervised learning is letting us learn both good mappings and good representations. Um, and something I'm, I'm quite keen on advocating, and I might be wrong on this, but what we really want to learn, which is, harder than representations is world models. So that's having an understanding of things like causality. It's understanding that if I fly to Calcutta, I don't want my bag to end up in Hyde. Um, all these sorts of things, having rich understandings about how the world works. 
and I'm kind of keeping my fingers crossed and hoping that we're going to have some work coming in the future that makes progress on all three of these things. So what happens um, if this works? Okay, so I, I just spent a bit of time sort of bashing sentiment analysis and conversational agents. So what happens if this works? So we get conversational agents that can work, and I, I really cannot stress how absolutely massive this is going to be. The reason I'm um, I'm bashing conversational agents is not because I think it's a useless problem. I think it's one of the most important problems we can tackle. Um, it's just that it really does not work yet at all. Um, the same thing with sentiment. If we can work out whether how people are really feeling in a really rich sense, um, there are so many more opportunities open to us, particularly if we can get an algorithm that does that. So these two things are just incredibly exciting, but it's just worth being true to ourselves and being honest that we are we are a long, long way away from having um, actually being able to do these things. So, but it's it's very, very exciting if we uh, we do get it working. Um, general robustness as well. Um, you know, we we want to be able to uh, put something in a situation it hasn't seen before and it's still to perform well. And I, I think this kind of um, will lead to quite a significant mental shift in how people um, interact with machine learning. So people really need to trust these algorithms before they start learning, uh, start using them on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, I don't think people do really trust these algorithms yet. So if I, if I was having a heart attack, I would not trust a chatbot to be able to call me an ambulance by me saying, I have a, I'm having a heart attack, help me. But when they can do that, um, things get very, very exciting very, very quickly. So again, I don't think we're there yet and we've still got a long way to go, but when we do get there, everything's gonna be very, very exciting. Um, uh, I'm just gonna finish with like a quick, quick coda before we, we come to questions. And this is a, um, uh, a slightly less optimistic prediction about where machine learning might look like in five to 10 years. Um, I haven't quite got this narrative all uh, all consistent and uh, slick in my head. So if it doesn't come out particularly well, um, I apologize and it still needs some working through. So push back on this in the questions if you disagree. So I'd, I'd love to hear people disagreeing with this. Um, so I did a bit of Googling and I, and I found companies where on the first page of their, their website, this is what they said. So I've got three examples here. Our AI powered automation software is built to predict, control and grow businesses. When companies can spot patterns, make predictions, and respond faster than the competitors, their potential is unlimited. We transform their business models and use machine learning to grow sales and engage with customers. We thrive on the opportunity to solve challenging problems and help businesses using artificial intelligence. So I actually think these three sentences are just a whole load of nothing. There's, there's nothing being said in these. It's just waffle. Um, people with more commercial experience than me might disagree because this is not my area and I don't really know what I'm talking about. But I find this quite startling that there are these companies who are saying, oh, we use machine learning, we use artificial intelligence, but they're not actually saying really what they're using it for. They're just trying to tell people that they're using these technologies. Um, and then they have these, these horrific stock photographs all over their website, um, um, which I think is when you see this, you know, I mean, I, I've done stuff that's used these sort of pictures before. So um, it's, it, it is uh, just a signal that maybe something's not quite right and you can see all the top research labs they basically never use images like this um, because they just think it really misrepresents and um, miscommunicates what is actually happening with these algorithms um, so the, the symptoms that there's something not quite right in the field at the moment um, again is ai is we're using ai to solve problems but the fact that we're using ai is inherently more desirable than solving the problem so people would rather use ai than just solve a problem. And if you're solving a problem, it doesn't matter what techniques you use to do it. But at the moment, everyone is keen to shout from the rooftops that they're using AI instead of shouting from the rooftops the problems that they're solving. And that, that seems a little, a little bit backwards to me. Like it really, it really shouldn't matter the tools you're using as long as you're um, solving problems well. Um, I'm aware of the absolute hypocrisy in this because this whole presentation has been um, about you know, 40 minutes of nothing but AI punditry. Um, but it, from my experience of interacting with different people um, sort of on the commercial side of things and in industry is there there's this whole class of people who their their job and what they do for a living is kind of just being pundits about AI and saying how it's going to change all these these different fields without actually having really any shred of understanding of what's going on. Um, and, and that's quite worrying as they sort of claim claim to be experts and tell people what's going to happen. Um, but they just really have such they they're basically sort of not lying, but they're really misrepresenting their knowledge about, about what's actually happening. Um, and I'm aware of the complete hypocrisy on that. So 
um, yeah, feel free to call me out on it. Um, um, applications are coming before algorithms. So um, when people sort of talk about machine learning, they're much quicker to say, oh, it's going to solve this problem um, and this problem and this problem, and it's going to change this field and this field and this field, um, without actually, you know, the, explaining how the algorithms are going to let them do that. There's this real disconnect between proposing um, how we use machine learning and actually understanding how it works. And uh, yeah, and, and finally, there's just this it ties in with the point above. There's this increasing disconnect with the technology and the presentation of the technology. Um, so you have people going around talking about machine learning, um, presenting it in these really favorable lights, but they're just really unaware of the shortcomings of the current algorithms that we have. Um, so in terms of how we respond to this, I think we sort of all have a almost a responsibility to, to sort of steward this field because I think the potential is so great. And in the next decade or two, if we steward machine learning and AI well, it's gonna make a lot of people's lives a lot, lot better. Um, but we have to make sure that it's communicated in the right way and we're not overselling it and we're being honest and we're not trying to sort of con people out some more money because we're saying we're using AI. And that's a responsibility I think we all have. Um, and we're sort of all in it together, but I think if, if we can just make more of an effort to, in, in how we communicate these technologies and, and trying to maybe just understand them a bit more, I think the future is really bright. So we've all got an opportunity here to do something really, really great that people have never done before in terms of developing these technologies. Um, so yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd, I'd love to, I think we've got about 15 minutes to answer them. So it's so plenty of time. Um, uh, if you don't have any questions, you, you can connect with me or link, on LinkedIn or you can, um, go to Speechmatic's website if you're interested in our technology. Um, but yeah, get get in touch if, you, if you're interested. Um, other than that, I will just start trying to answer some questions. So some people have asked some, which is which is great. I'm sorry if my answers aren't very good. Um, how would you manage if there is not an agreement in the transcription? For example, three people transcribe your data and they're not the same. Would you add some measure of uncertainty in your model, e.g. label smoothing or something more fancy? Yeah, this is an absolutely brilliant question. So um, if I'm paying people to generate some labeled data, so um, there, I, I might ask three people, different people to transcribe um, an hour's worth of people speaking. Um, it's quite likely they'll transcribe it slightly differently. And this is like a really big problem because um, we, it goes and in, ties into what I was talking about earlier. And that, that it means you can't really trust your labels and your, there's this saying of like garbage in, garbage out. So if you feed your um, machine learning system with bad data, it's gonna produce really bad predictions. And so this is like a real problem. In, in terms of um, how we manage it at Speechmatics, um, our solution is just to uh, add more data and get more data labeled and hope that if we use 10,000 hours worth of labeled data, these mistranscriptions sort of disappear in the wash. And it's not particularly fancy. And there, there are fancier ways you can deal with noisy, noisy labels and it's, um, it's quite an active area of research, but how we do it is basically just get more data. Um, and if you use unlabeled data, you don't have this problem because there's no transcript to mess up because it's all contained in the audio. Um, is language modeling only done in English or does it relate to other languages? Since every language has its grammatical differences, can it all come from English language modeling? Yep, another great question. So um, typically all these language models are trained completely separately. So I'll have an English language model where I only feed it English data and it will predict the next English word. And I might have a, um, you know, an Arabic language model where I predict, uh, send it the first half of Arabic sentences and it predicts the next word. Um, you, you also, it becomes more complicated for something like Mandarin because um, uh, I'm, I'm probably gonna absolutely butcher here how, how Mandarin structured, but my understanding is the tokens are sort of um, composed of lots of smaller tokens. And I think language model in Mandarin, you predict all of the, the tokens sort of sequentially. So you don't predict a word at once, you predict the, the subwords at once. So um, Often, because speechmatics we transcribe into lots of different languages, we have to have language models because we, we use language modeling in our transcription system. Um, we have to have language models for all these different languages and for things like Korean and Japanese and Mandarin, we have to use what are called subwords. Um, so it does change from language to language, but um, the, the core technique of taking something and predicting the future applies, applies across all of them. So does an NLP need to understand the rules of language before it comes self-supervised? Uh, and this is this is a little bit of magic in that it doesn't. So if you just feed it enough data, it will learn how grammar works before, without you having to tell it at all. It will just learn it, which is um, uh, which is just it's just magical. So that's one of the great things about self-supervised learning is it lets you scale with lots and lots of data. 
and this stuff just sort of um sort of appears out of nowhere which i think is a uh, great um how much time does it take to translate from the video file um i assume that is talking about if we want to transcribe a video file i, I might be wrong on this um you'd have to talk to someone at speech matters because i um i don't know so you'd, you'd have to you'd have to talk to one of our sales reps um what languages does it support um we support i think 30 different languages so quite a lot um most european languages we do a lot of languages in um southeast asia um yeah so 30 different languages i think puts us up there in terms of the languages we can support as a transcription transcription service um what is the cost um how many access allow per login you'd have to talk to the commercial side of speech matic so get in touch we, we can answer all these these questions um, um what does speech matic offer today um, ai or not that differentiates you so i actually went to a conference a uh, sales conference and i learned all about this sort of stuff um, but what we do as speech matics is there's sort of three things we focus on so there's language support which i mentioned earlier um, it's also very high accuracy so we believe we are are as accurate as uh, cloud providers like google and amazon if not more accurate in certain settings um, and the a kind of key selling point for us is that we can offer on-prem solutions so a lot of the people we sell to are very sensitive data who don't want to get it transcribed inside google cloud and they don't want google to have access to their data so we can offer them a container which lets them transcribe on premise. So that, that's like a key selling point is we, we work a lot with people who have confidential data and don't wanna stick it on the internet. So those are the sort of three things we, we focus on as a business. So range of language support, language accuracy, uh, on-prem deployment. Um, that's, that's kind of our, our value prop. Uh, someone saying, thank you for the talk, excellent talk. Thank you very much. Um, when do you think we can reach the top of self-supervised learning and machines? In 10 years earlier, regards from mexico wow all the way from mexico um thank you for tuning in um i'm not actually going to put a time box on this because it will almost certainly be wrong at, at the moment i've tried to gear my prediction to, to things that at least have a chance of being right um i think if i say um uh oh it's going to happen in the next however many years i'll almost certainly be wrong um what i will say about self-supervised learning in particular is that there's self-supervised learning systems that work at the moment so to an extent, it's already here. It's just sort of in these academic communities and it hasn't hasn't made its way um, into sort of industry and mainstream um, yet. So so I'm a bit more confident that self-supervised learning should be here in the next year or two. It's something that my group at Speechmatics are working a lot on is like, how can we um, how can we take these techniques and actually use them in terms of making our transcription better? So that's kind of what my, my research area is at the moment. Um, how will cross-lingual data be used in the future to help smaller languages which don't have much data of their own? Um, great question. Um, very active area of research. So um, one, one uh, method I've seen of dealing with this, which is actually kind of kind of interesting and cool, is um, you know, I when I was talking about translation, I said, okay, we have to have an English sentence and then I have to have a corresponding Samoan sentence. Um, but actually there might not be many translations of english work into samoan work and vice versa so the particular corpus for that is very very small and then if i had to do um say french to samoan um i have to again come up with a whole new set of data which is not great so what there's been some research doing is i take um some english data i encode it into some sort of machine language and then i can decode that to french so if i have an english and a french sentence i can sort of train what's called an english encoder and a french decoder then if I have an English Samoan sentence, I can use the same English encoder, map it to the space and train the Samoan decoder. And then if I'm having a French Samoan sentence, I can use a French encoder and the same Samoan de decoder. So I can sort of um, reuse uh, bits and pieces um, from lots of different language pairings. So I don't, need an inter I don't need a whole new system when I do English to French as when I do English to Samoan as when I do French to Samoan. So there's lots of cool reuse you can use there. Um, it's, not, it's not exactly my area of expertise, but I know that that's one thing people are looking at, which is, which is quite cool. Um, do you foresee some industries being able to advance quicker than others? Um, um, I'm probably not the best person to answer this question. Um, in terms of, I'm not sure it's like gonna, the response time is necessarily gonna be on an industry by industry basis. It's more who within the industries have got their finger on the pulse a little bit more. So that's, that's why I wanted to do this talk is keep everyone's finger back on the pulse a little bit um, so they can uh, 
you know, see what might be coming. So it's just people being willing to change and, and really having this mental shift that, um, that the technology we have in machine learning at the moment really isn't fixed. Um, what you're seeing at the moment is just a snapshot of how capable it is as of today, but tomorrow it's going to be more capable. The day after that, it's going to be more capable. And if you, if you set yourself up to anticipate that change and not locking yourself into the current paradigm um, in terms of AI machine learning, I think you'll be in a much, much better place. Um, do you have Indian languages data too? I think we do, um, but I'm not going to say for certain. Um, do you have? A, do you think a productive route would be applying machine learning to addressing the general problem of inferencing? What would the input, input data look like? Um, yeah, so uh, inference is sort of a topic I am very interested in. Um, and, you know, there's been lots of good work done in the last sort of 30, 40 years about um, how we can do good inference. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the, the, the I, I think the thing you need to do good, good inference is sort of better algorithms and better ways of um, dealing with things like intractability and, and, and things like that, as opposed to having different input data. Um, so I think in terms of making progress on inference, I think that's going to come more from the algorithmic side than, than how, what the input data is going to look like. Um, uh, greetings from Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. So the other Cambridge, thank you. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, what is your current margin of error percentage in your transcription speech to text software? Um, and I'm not actually going to give an answer here because it varies massively depending on um, the setting. So if you are in a clean room using a, a really high quality microphone, then it's, it's, um, it's like very, very low. It's nearly as accurate as a human transcribing it. However, if you are in a noisy background and you're using lots of um, weird words and there's people shouting in the background, the accuracy is unsurprisingly going to change quite significantly. Um, something we work on a lot at Speechmatics is making sure we actually do a lot better than other providers in those noisy settings. So there is there is no one number here because it, it changes so much. Um, but um, what we encourage people to do is just try our system, try our software on the domain that's sort of most relevant to you and you can sort of evaluate, evaluate it for yourself. So the, the best way to evaluate these things is just to try it for yourself. Um, and see whether it's, uh, the accuracy is good enough for your use case. Um, with a move towards causal reasoning, do you foresee a resurgence of first order log languages like Prolog that uh, reigned previously to show resurgence? Um, oh, that's a very good question. Um, uh, firstly, I do see a massive shift towards, as I talked about in the presentation, I think there's going to be a massive shift towards causal reasoning. I think it's something we absolutely need to do. Um, in terms of the languages support, I, I'm not sure there's necessarily uh, basically all machine learning stuff at the moment is done in Python and I'm not sure there's necessarily a reason to move away from that at the moment. Um, uh, I don't see it going back to something like Prolog. Um, you know, I've been trying to learn Lisp at the moment and that seems quite cool, but e e even so, I still don't think that's going to be really going to topple um, the massive momentum that's behind like Python and TensorFlow and PyTorch at the moment. Um, but I could be wrong. Um, any views on the use of visual modality lip reading to augment accuracy and noise video transcription? Um, so there's a good researcher, who I think it's called Andrew Zimmerman, who um, looks at this sort of stuff, basically using self-supervised learning um, in the form of he'll play um, a video at the same time as um, as the corresponding audio, and that that system very naturally learns to exploit lip reading or to be able to to clock when people move their lips, they're the people that are talking. Um, so that sort of drops out very naturally. And um, it's not something we're looking actively to exploit as speechmatics, but it's something we hope that in the future, if we have strong algorithms, they should be able to pick up these cues by themselves. Um, so yeah, so it's uh, definitely something that, that could help, but it'd be quite a big engineering effort. Um, any use cases you can share? Um, I assume this is talking about speechmatics in terms of how we use our tech. Um, I think if I'm wrong on that, you'll have to ask another question to correct me. Um, uh, but we sell a lot to contact centers, um, is a big place we sell to, uh, things like media asset management, uh, media monitoring. You'll have to talk to the commercial team because it's not my exact area of expertise, but I know some of those are some of the big markets we, we go after. Uh, broadcasting as well, that's another one. Um, yeah, better not to speculate. Um, this is already quite nice research. I hope I agree with you. I'm not exactly sure on where you're getting out there, but thank you. Thank you for tuning in nonetheless. Um, how does Speechmatics deal with unseen words, relies on language model? Um, so we have um, a word which is OOV, 
which is um, out of vocabulary. So we, we train to basically deal with words we haven't seen before. Um, in terms of transcription, we can only transcribe words that we are part of our vocabulary. But something that Speechmatics offers, um, which is kind of one of our key selling points, is something called custom dictionary. So if you have words that are very specific to your use case, um, what you can do is you can add them to that custom dictionary and Speechmatics will be able to transcribe them um, even though it's never seen those words before in training, which I think is really cool. It's one of like the coolest features of our our, um, our product. So de definitely look that out, uh, check that out. Um, and can you provide links and papers for your presentation? I'm sure we can send up a follow-up um, email with it on. Uh, in terms of the papers that are in here, there's the Contrast and Predicting Coded Paper by Aaron Van Der Noord. Um, there's the uh the grand and language models one which is i can't remember who, who that's by but that went on archive very recently um uh yoshua benji put out a good one called the consciousness prior that relates to some of this stuff we've been talking about um uh yeah i think those are the main ones i talked about I'll, i'm sure we'll have a way we can communicate those in the future um can you tell me about the challenge to move a promising research into production how likely it happens that it doesn't work maybe doesn't scale well with complicated data as the one you might use? Yeah, a really good question. Um, it is very, um, it is an eternal struggle to make sure this stuff scales properly. Uh, my experience of getting stuff to production is um, Speechmatics, we have a punctuation system where you, it takes a transcript and it can you know, capitalize it and punctuate it properly. And that started off as a bit of research in my group and we um, moved it all the way through to production. In terms of the, the problems we had, we we were lucky in that we have access to lots of data, so we can normally get the machine learning side of things working. The problems in terms of productionization normally comes in terms of making stuff run quickly enough and getting it working with like the current engineering structure, engineering infrastructure we have. Um, so those are the sort of challenges we face. Uh, is BERT considered self-supervised learning? Yes, it is. Um, I'm not sure if BERT falls under the category of language modeling or not. Um, it's slightly different, but yeah, BERT is absolutely self-supervised learning. It's one of the standout, um, poster boys of what happens when you get self-supervised learning working. Um, um, your estimate of 10 years plus for a very robust experience makes sense to me for an open-ended domain and consumer facing. At the other end of the spectrum, what about with the domain-specific control vocabulary in vertical industry, any estimate on when that becomes highly robust and stable? Um, my guess is that, um, sorry, I've just clocked, I'm, I'm reading these questions out quite fast, so I apologize if, um, if, if you've lost um, a load of what I've been saying. Um, I think to get stuff that's really robust, um, it, you do sort of have to be able to do everything. And, and you can sort of hack your way to specific results on like domain specific tasks, which is what the kind of the chatbots and so on are getting kind of good at is if you follow a very like narrow path, um, the results you get are all right. Um, uh, I don't have a better, answer in terms of exactly what use case you're envisioning. Um, but um, yeah, I guess my take is you probably need to be able to do good at everything. I'm not sure you can be robust in one domain and usable in one domain um, before you can necessarily be robust in, um, in all of them. Um, how do you manage age in your models? For example, if a kid speaks, you keep the same accuracy or still a problem for the company. I'm actually gonna go out on a limb here uh, and probably say what I shouldn't in that Speechmatics does really, really badly at transcribing kids' voices. Um, uh, the reason is because getting labeled data for children um, has all sorts of legal issues with it. So um, all speech to text companies, if you um, get a child to speak into the system, will typically do really, really badly because you can't really get access to labeled data um, for children's voices. So we don't do very well on that at all. But I'm hoping that if you have robust representations of speech, then you'll necessarily, hope, you know, hopefully get better at that. Um, um, um ba -bum. yeah so um thank you i think that's that's it